about all things coming new. Because there's a lot of new on the way. Which ties in very well to an announcement I'd like to make. This coming Tuesday, uh, I'm asking our church to fast and pray. Because as we are entering a new season of ministry, though we are a small church, though we are further inhibited by COVID and precautions, we still want to be the Lord's light in this neighborhood. Amen. And so I'm specifically asking us to fast and pray on Tuesday to ask the Lord, how would you have us do that? Because the shape of the vehicle doesn't matter. The heart of it is that we who are believers who call on the name of Jesus will get connected to disciple one-on-one, -on -one, to just get into people's lives who are far from God and shine the light one lost lamb at a time. Yeah. It's the vehicle that we need to figure out. And so there's nothing magical that happens when we fast and pray other than I believe it's our way of saying, Lord, we want to hear your voice more than we want to lean on the things we're used to usually leaning on. And I believe that God in his grace will meet us there. And that when we then come together on Wednesday evening at 7.30 via Zoom, I want us to use that time this week just to process through what we, where we sense God might be leading us and how we might sense he wants us to begin to reach out. So if y'all will join me, and I realize not everyone's able to fast physically from food, um, so fast in a way that you can. Uh, some people, you might want to take a fast from screens, from social media, from... I don't know, any number of things. The point is that we, we deprive ourselves in some small way because we want to hear from the Lord's voice in a big way. So with that, are there any other announcements that we need to have come before this house this morning? All right. And welcome to those of you who are watching us online. We're glad you are here, and I pray that the Lord speaks to you today just like he speaks to all of us. Last week, we talked about New Year's resolutions, right? We talked about our inability to really carry them out fully because even in a brand new year, we're still the same people. We have the same thought processes, the same habits, the same sinful flesh. But then we turn to 2 Corinthians 5, 17, didn't we? Which says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Jesus can make us completely new in a way that no outward change ever could. So it isn't new year, new you. It's new you for a new year. But then the funniest thing happens. As we live into the new creations Jesus has made us, as we walk with him, dying to ourselves each day, we start to see the fruit of his Holy Spirit growing in us. So the next step for us is to talk about what that new life will look like. And that's exactly where we're going today. Last week was New Year, New You, question mark. This week is New You, New Fruit. And the actual verse for the fruit of the Spirit is a very well-known one. But the surrounding verses, as well as the context of that letter as a whole, may be less familiar. So we're going to dig into that first as we begin to learn about who Jesus is making us to be. But first, we need to pray. Would you join me? Almighty God, not my words but your own, move me out of the way. Holy Spirit, open our hearts and minds that we could hear you speaking to us today. That we could hear your gentle voice calling us further to walk towards you, to let go of ourselves and our lives, to walk in surrender and submission and humility that you may begin to grow in us the fruit of your spirit. For that is our desire. That is how we walk successfully in the Christian life and how we can begin to shine your light into the world around us. So speak to us this day, Jesus. Amen. Now, this letter to the Galatians was written by Paul, and that has never, ever been seriously contested. Seriously, of all the letters that they contest, this is not one of them. And he was most likely writing to the people of southern Galatia. You see on the map this kingdom of Galatia. It was a Roman province. 
And you see, on his first missionary journey, he goes up and around to Pisidian Antioch before going back down to Lystra and Derby, and then makes his way back through and around. So he's most likely writing to the people in southern Galatia, those people he visited on his first missionary journey in AD 47 and 48. However, you see that little green circle up there with Ancyra around it? That was known as the Kingdom of Galatia. There were some there was an ethnic group there called Galatians. They were Gauls who had moved there from France, what we call France. And they had settled there. And you see, on his second journey, he kind of went close to there, but maybe not quite to there. So there are some people who think maybe the letter to the Galatians was to them. However, that would have put us at a much later date of writing the letter. And also, he doesn't mention something really exceptional that happens in AD 48, which was the Jerusalem Council. Because he, of what he was writing to the Galatians about, he almost certainly would have mentioned it if that had happened, because it would have added so much weight to what he's saying. So we can really, pretty safely, I think, pinpoint that he was writing to the southern Galatians and that he wrote this about AD 48. So that's about 17 years, 18 years after Jesus' death and resurrection, about 10 years since Paul's conversion to Christianity. Now, what's really interesting is because it was written so early, it's one of Paul's very first letters that we know about. Even, maybe it is the very first we know about. And it's a really unique letter of his because there's no thanksgiving section at the beginning. He introduces himself and he goes straight into the action. In most of his other letters, he introduces himself, says grace and peace, I thank God every time I remember you, like he says to the Philippians, none of that here, because Paul is upset with his church. <laughs> Apparently, a sect of Jewish Christians had infiltrated the Galatian church, and this group had led the new believers astray by convincing them that they also had to keep the Mosaic law if they were to be saved by Christ. Now keep in mind, these Galatian believers, you can see where they are. This is kind of what we consider modern day Turkey. If we were to go down and around, you see where it says Syria, Israel and Jerusalem is just to the south of there. These folks were Gentiles. They were far away from the Jewish faith. So they didn't know the law and they did not keep the law. And maybe it was because they were so new in their faith because Paul is writing to them probably about a year after he had first planted the churches. So they're new converts still. Or maybe it's because they knew that their salvation had come from the Jews. These folks fell for it, and they fell for it hard. But Paul is not having it. And it makes me stop and wonder, what kind of false doctrines can we fall for? Now, he introduces himself as the apostle. He wishes them grace and peace, and then he goes straight into a strong rebuke. He reminds the Galatians that there is no other gospel apart from the real good news of Jesus and that their salvation is through faith in him alone. It has nothing to do with their works. He then takes the Galatians back through his own story, including his conflict with the apostle Peter. You see, Paul makes no bones about standing up for the truth, just as he's doing here. Because a false doctrine that puts the focus on the Galatians and on their works, on what they're doing, will completely derail their growth in true Christian faith. Because it is only by faith that the righteous shall live, not by works of the law. And he then talks about the nature of the law and the captivity of all of those who are under the law. But now we have been set free and been made sons and daughters of the Lord because of the work of Jesus. And he opens chapter 5, where our passage for today is, by exhorting them to stand firm in the freedom given by Christ and to not again submit to a yoke of slavery. Because circumcision, the quintessential sign of keeping the whole Jewish law, is meaningless. We even talked about that last week, if you'll remember. It doesn't matter whether we've been circumcised or not. What counts is whether we have been transformed into a new creation. And he closes the section before our text for today by calling them to live into their freedom, but not to use it as a license for the flesh. Rather, we should love and serve one another, 
Because loving your neighbor as yourself is the calling of the law that should still be kept. And then we arrive at a beautiful passage about the life in the Spirit. Galatians 5, 16 through 26. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Boy, I'm glad my kids are not in the room. <laughs> and believe it or not, in things like these, there are more. <laughs> I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Amen. And I'm going to just move that back, and we're going to kind of walk through this passage a little bit at a time. Because just before our passage... Paul was highlighting the difference between the flesh and real love. And now Paul moves that into a comparison to life in the Holy Spirit. And his phrase here, walk by the Spirit, it implies both direction and empowerment. So the Holy Spirit not only shows us the way we should go, he actually helps us do it. He gives us the strength to do it. Like love your neighbor as yourself. The Holy Spirit can show us how do that, and then it can also actually help us do it. Walk by the Spirit also shows that it is a continuous action. It's not one and done. It's the habit. It's the pattern of one's life. In contrast, the desires of the flesh do not just mean bodily cravings, but the desires of all fallen humans. These desires are at enmity with God's design and purposes. And they actually want to pull us away from God by getting us to do the things we do not really want to do. The answer to fighting off those sinful desires is to walk by the Spirit. And he then jumps into discussing the law because those who are led by the Spirit are no longer under the law. And in the Greek, the word for led implies an active and very personal involvement with believers, an intimacy. And it is in the present tense to show us that this involvement and leadership is ongoing. Just as our walking in the Spirit is not one and done, so is the Holy Spirit's leadership and involvement with us not once and then gone. Ongoing, active. In direct conflict with that, Paul then lists the works of the flesh. These are the works that fallen and unredeemed humans will naturally move toward, and which the transformation of the Holy Spirit replaces with godly desires. Sexual immorality of any kind. That word for sexual immorality is kind of interesting. In the Greek, it's porneia. It's where we get our modern English word, pornography. The spectrum of what we would call sexual immorality is probably far greater than most conservative Christians would like for it to be. But that's a sermon for another day. <laughs> Impurity and sensuality, these are unhealthy indulgences and in lusts of the flesh. Now, idolatry and sorcery are interesting as they show the desire that all humans have to be in touch with the spiritual realities of the universe. Have you ever met someone who perhaps 
is spiritual, but not in a Christian, truth-bound way. Now, in ancient times, this also pertained to the use of mind-altering drugs to aid in ritual worship of pagan deities. However, these methods are misled and use humanly invented means to connect with these gods rather than the pathway the Lord has given us in Jesus. Because though God is supposedly the ultimate object, they completely miss the way, the truth, and the life that is Jesus. Because no one can come to the Father except through Jesus. Jesus himself said that in John 14, 6. He then turns in his list of works of the flesh to interpersonal relationships because our fallen nature messes this up too. Enmity and strife indicate competition, conflict, as fallen humans are only looking out for themselves rather than loving their neighbors. Further, jealousy shows us unhealthy focus on our neighbors. Look at what they have. Why don't I have that? Rather than developing a contentment and gratitude for where the Lord has placed us, where the Lord has placed me. This all comes to a head, fits of anger, with rivalries, with dissensions, with divisions and envy. And sadly, I think a lot of us can speak to having seen those very things in the Lord's church, which I think should keep us really, really humble and seeking to walk by the Spirit, to be led by the Spirit so we don't fall into that. On the other end of the spectrum of fallen interpersonal behavior, we see drunkenness and orgies, people getting along a little too well, perhaps. This is where people misuse the good gifts of God in ways that are harmful to everyone involved. And some of those things were also part of pagan worship rituals as well. Paul then says that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And this is really, really important, so I want you to listen very carefully to me right now. Because those of us who have called on the name of Jesus to be saved, who have been made new, who are learning to walk in submission and humility with the Holy Spirit, we will still make mistakes. Yeah. We will still sin. That is not what this passage is talking about. It does not mean that people who still make mistakes and struggle with sin will not inherit the kingdom. There's such a world of difference between saying, I'm okay with this sin and struggling with it. In the Greek, the present participle helps us understand that this word translated, do such things, is really about those who make a practice of such things, who live in the habit of of fleshly patterns. Much like those who walk by the Spirit make that the pattern, the habit of their lives, so the opposite is also true. These fleshly patterns are so ingrained that the outward behaviors show the inward disposition of their hearts. So take heart, my friends. If you still struggle with sin, if you struggle with doing the things that you hate and not being able to do the things that you want to do, we're in good company together. Amen. We're in good company with the Apostle Paul. Remember Romans 7 and 8. Let those sins humble us and drive us right back to the foot of the cross in need of Jesus. In his book, The Four Loves, C.S. Lewis put it this way. And that's two weeks in a row, C.S. Lewis. Y'all are <laughs> going to figure out my influences really quickly. But he says this. The good man is sorry for the sins which have increased his need, the need being the need for God. He is not entirely sorry for the fresh need they produced. We hate the sin, but we're not entirely sorry that it humbles us and drives us right back to the foot of the cross. But for those whose outward pattern of fleshly behavior shows an inward disposition and direct defiance of God, I implore you, turn away. Turn to Jesus. You can be made new too. No one is ever too far gone. Amen. 
And from here, Paul moves into where we're really trying to get to today. The fruit of the Spirit. The things that we can expect to start seeing in our lives as we walk with Jesus, as we are led by his Holy Spirit. And it is so critical for us to remember we can't produce these things. We can't manufacture them. We can't just pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and create the fruit of the Spirit. These are fruits that grow from the life that God has placed in us in His Holy Spirit. So if you have not surrendered your life to the Lordship of Jesus, stop listening to me. How many preachers will ever tell you that? But if you are not a follower of Jesus, don't listen anymore. <laughs> because I'm not trying to tell us what we need to try to do. I'm not. I'm trying to give us a glimpse, just a slice of an image of the kind of people that Jesus is trying to remake us to be. Yes. Also, this is so interesting to me, the Greek of fruit of the Spirit is singular. Now, that other list we read, the works of the flesh, the phrase that set that, off, that list off, that's plural. Fruit of the Spirit is singular. It's one. Now, there's a little disagreement on that, in fairness. Some commentators think that it's something of a collective unity, meaning everything listed is separate but kind of works together. And so, in, in that iteration, that version, love is listed first because it's the most prominent. In, in ancient Greek lists, the very first thing that was listed was the most important. Other commentators with whom I agree, as well as the Reverend Dr. Terry Bell agrees, <laughs> think that we can make a really strong case that the one and only fruit of the Spirit is love, and that the others color that in for us. They show us the many different dimensions and facets and richness of what love in this biblical sense looks like. Either way, love is the predominant fruit of the Holy Spirit. And because it is so important and because we have so little time left today, we'll be looking at what love really means in the biblical sense over the next two or three weeks. And spoiler alert, we in the modern West have got it really, really wrong. <laughs> but for now, the fruit of the Spirit is love, reflecting the very nature of God who gave us his Son for our best good even though we were his enemies. It's not a physical attraction, an emotional affection, or even a family bond. But we'll get more into that in the weeks to come. Joy, a contentment that is far deeper than a fleeting feeling of happiness. It's rooted in our, our eternal salvation, our eternal destiny because of who Jesus is and what he's done and where we know we are going. Peace. The kind of supernatural inner calm that allowed Paul to be joyful even in prison. Patience. The ability to show the grace that God has given to us, that he has given to me, to others. And to endure suffering and hardship well. Kindness. This is showing goodness, generosity, true concern toward others. Goodness. This is all about working for the good of others above ourselves. And that's made possible by the moral and spiritual righteousness given by the Holy Spirit and the new focus that the Holy Spirit gives us. Faithfulness. Think about being dependable, about seeing through what we have said we will see through. Loyalty, trustworthiness. Gentleness. Go look on Facebook, you'll see tons of gentleness right now. This quality allows others to find peace and rest in our presence. And also encourages and strengthens others. It's meek. It doesn't have to prove itself. It doesn't seek retribution or revenge or one-upping. I was being sarcastic about Facebook, by the way. Yeah. 
<laughs> Self-control. This is the power the Holy Spirit gives us to resist the draw of the flesh. And Paul says against such things there is no law because they're all good. And truly, when the Holy Spirit helps us live this way, we are fulfilling the law, much more so than even those who so faithfully try to keep the Jewish law, and certainly much more than those who are trapped by the flesh. For those who belong to Christ have crucified their flesh to live by the Spirit. The war against the flesh is won, even though we believers still have to fight the battle. And here Paul says, let us keep in step with the Spirit. He says, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. And that's a different verb than the being led by the Spirit we heard earlier. This one carries the idea of adding to it, following in line behind a leader, walking in submission and surrender, following the leader. But he closes with, let's not become conceited. As we start to grow this fruit of the Spirit, this love that has these different dimensions to it, we can't let it puff us up, because then we're right back where we would have started. Rather, it leads us to truly love one another above ourselves. Well, that's great, Pastor Matthew, but what on earth am I supposed to do with all that? Great question, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> I, think, I think the call for us is to examine ourselves. And even more importantly, ask the Holy Spirit to examine us. Do you remember when Jesus told his disciples to beware of false prophets and that they would recognize them by their fruit? Well, in Matthew 7, 17 and 18, he says, so every healthy tree bears good fruit but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. So I think the question we must ask ourselves and ask the Lord is whether or not we are bearing the fruit of the Spirit, which is love. Love. And remember, we'll spend the next two or three weeks talking about what love really means in the Bible. But from right now, I would encourage you, encourage all of us, take some time this week, set aside a little bit of time every day to read through this Galatians passage, this fruit of the Spirit passage. Study it, meditate over it. Let, let the Lord's works, words speak to us in the deep places of our hearts. And let's ask the Holy Spirit to show us how well are we letting him grow his life in us? And if he shows us any areas that we need to repent of or surrender, may we find his grace to help us do just that. Because he's made us new, and he is making us new. And friends, if you are anything like me, right now you have a check in your spirit. I know I do. And I want to encourage you because I think that's a good sign. It shows us that we don't think we fully arrived yet. And it also shows us that we're not too far gone. If you have that check in your spirit, let me encourage you. Do something with it. Don't put it off until later. But right now, in this holy moment, Bring it to the cross. Don't go home, have lunch, turn on a football game, take a nap, whatever. Let it drive you a hundred miles an hour to the foot of the cross, where we see the one who knew no sin carrying all of our sin to death. Because, friends, our sin is dead. Sometimes we just have to remind it of that. Don't let this moment pass you by. And if you are watching this online, if you want to talk to me, I would love that opportunity to talk and to pray with you. 
send a direct message or, or leave a comment, some way that we can get in touch with you and I will get in touch with you. How many talking heads on the internet can say that to you? For those of us who are here, in just a moment we're going to pray and I'm gonna ask BJ to turn a little bit of music on for us. If you have that check in your spirit, just don't wait. Don't wait. Come to the cross now. Because I know me, and if y'all are anything like me, with the best of intentions, I'll say I'll come back to that later, and then I won't. So let me pray for you, and then we will leave some time and space for the Lord to minister to us, and for us to turn to him. Because Jesus, we need you. We need your help. We cannot manufacture true love in the way that you have loved us. And Jesus, reading this passage, I realize I'm not there. And I think many of us realize that we aren't there yet. But we want to be. We want to be on the road. We want to be growing in your eternal life. Because even though you took our sin to the cross to die, you did not stay dead, Jesus. You rose again on the third day to show us eternal life. Which is not just a ticket into heaven when we die but life in your spirit here and now. Yeah. And Jesus, that's the life that we want to know. That's the life that we want to grow in us, empowering us to be your light in this world around us. Jesus, now in this holy moment, would you meet us where we are? Slow us down. We're listening. We pray in your most holy name.